Hello. So it's the calm before the storm, the penultimate game week before we lose our perma captaincy for one week. Uh, and we're back to discuss the week just gone, things happening ahead, and more as we hopefully provide you value today. Funnily enough, that's what the pod's all about, right, Lucy? Right. Who? who that's what. That was a great start. Well done. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Value. Can't wait to talk about it. Um. Particularly pleased to be recording at such a civilized time of the evening. Of course, I'm not doing quite as well as you and your top 10k rank, but I'm sure we'll get onto that later. I'm, I'll, you'll be reluctant to black to brag, so I'll have to do it on your behalf. We are who got the assist. You can find Tom on the main main Twitter account at wdta underscore fbl, and I'm Lucy at Lucy Hynett with two T's. On the pod today, we'll be discussing value, as we just said. What does this mean in a fantasy football context? How does it differ from price, and why is that important? And in the second half, we'll be looking at mini league updates at the time of recording, the market forces and the listener questions. We are recording in the evening of Monday, the 10th of October. Forest Villa is yet to kick off, but it's just the empty, pointless hope of a Nico Williams return, which looks even more um, unlikely now that he's not playing, which is keeping FPL interest players interested. Yep, Leon Bailey as well uh, didn't hasn't played. So I think he's injured or something. Well... What glory and wonder that is for FPL managers. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the forgotten child of the, the FPL game week. So I think this is probably going to be the worst viewed Monday night football ever, I'm assuming. Uh, what a terrible game this is. People well, were just giving be. out their ranks yesterday like this didn't exist, weren't they, really? I know, but just so, there's not enough to move the needle in it, is there? That's the, that's the thing. So I could see why people were doing it, that's for sure. I think giving your rank out midweek um, is probably a little bit presumptive but giving your rank up before this you're probably okay let's face it it kind of makes a lot of sense anyway we'll get on to rank later uh, let's start off though with the main topic this week which is value and fpl what does it mean so i think value is a very vexed word and that is often used a lot to mean price but i think that those two things are actually separate entities so i think value is a concept that changes over the course of the season and by value i always think that this is the perceived worth of a player in FPL in terms of points potential. And price is often used as a proxy for value, but I don't think that's what it actually is. That makes sense. I think price is perhaps part of it, but I don't think value actually does mean price. I mean, what does it mean to you? You see this word thrown around a lot and we were talking about it over the weekend, weren't we? I mean, what does it mean to you, Lucy? I guess it's kind of return on your investment to a certain extent. Like... Price is one thing, but we've experienced this season that price doesn't always mean points. So if if you're thinking about how you want to invest in your squad, value to me means what that player is returning on that investment. And I guess that's kind of something I closely relate with kind of points per million as an idea as well, like the efficiency you're getting out of your investment. Um, I guess also the value of explosivity is the way I put it, as in kind of their ceiling. So we often think of the most valuable players are those the ones that kind of have big hauls and kind of can propel you up the ranks with a big score. Um, I did think that value wasn't just about kind of price from a kind of monetary value, but whether a player gives you value in terms of your three per team limit. So for example, at the moment, putting game week 12 aside, Jacka might work out as good value versus others at his price point, but there would be a question about whether he was a good use of an Arsenal slot, for example. So that kind of value. Um, and then I and then I was thinking also tying it very nicely to Talisman theory as to whether they were kind of important or central to their team would also represent a different kind of value. So I've tried to not like get too bound up with price because, as you say, I think it's a discernibly different thing. But I do think they're often closely associated. Yeah, no, I, I think that's about right. There's definitely lots of facets of value, aren't there? I mean, I think broadly speaking, at the start of the season, price is value because we've got nothing to go on. I know people will always say, oh, he's doing very well in the friendlies. Oh, he had great form at the end of last year. But really, we haven't got very much to go on apart from the price. And as far as I know, um, official FPL set price is based on the perceived value of a player based on the last season or seasons. So that can lead to some weird situations. So remember the, the season when Leicester won the league, Mahrez 5.5, Vardy, he was like seven. The next season, you know, Mahrez was up at 10 and Vardy was up at 11, something like that. But things fluctuate over time. And this kind, this means basically that prices follow 
what happened the year before. And at the start of the season, that's what we've got. That's all we've got to work on. But during the course of the season, I kind of see it as price and value sort of diverging a little bit. Like price remains fairly constant. It is what it is. It's, it's kind of fixed. You don't see players like jump around loads. You see them jump around like 0.8, something like that. But you don't really ever see them go through the roof. A really good example of how price and value can diverge. Um, I was thinking a couple of years ago, I think was, I'm going to say 2019, 20, uh, De Bruyne, he was 9.5. So I remember he was injured a lot the season before and you got kind of like 50 points or something like that. That season, 251 points, price at 9.5. So the price bore no relation whatsoever to the value that De Bruyne would bring to your team. Now, this year, things are still emerging. But someone like Martinelli being 6.0 at the start of the season, but being the third highest scorer midfielder at the moment, outscoring the likes of Son and Salah, is a good example of how price and value have started to diverge here too. And on the, on, and on the other side of it, you have players who have dropped. Um, so their price and value are nowhere near representative from that angle as well. So Mason Mount dropped seven point to 7.6 from 8.0 start price. Um, but players can redeem themselves. So I saw... a. Bruno Guimarães or Group Bruno G, as I'm going to call him, at Newcastle dropped 0.4. Um, but this weekend looked like he could be showing signs of recovery as an asset, of a real game-winning performance. So, yeah, I mean, as the season progresses, value supersedes price in importance in many ways. And the nub of the issue is obviously, you know, the old adage of picking players who will score the most points. But I just feel like we're often led by price uh, when we're making decisions. But as we get more data, Lucy, I think it should increasingly be at value, shouldn't it? Absolutely. Um, I think you're right in the sense that at the beginning of the season, we have really no idea who will represent value. So you kind of use price as your indicator because price is essentially historic performance. That's what that price denotes. So you will find every season that there is a player. I mean, Jared Bowen being a great example last season, a player who far outstripped what we expected of them and thus they represented great value. Um, I think the, the kind of fact you have to get your head around is that you can't get value out of every single slot because you kind of have 100 million to spend on 15 players. So you will need to spend that money to maximise your points, but you will find that the more expensive players often represent kind of diminishing returns for the investment. So you mm. spend more on them, but they don't get the kind of the same level of points as you're kind of spending extra, but you need to use the money. So it's a bit of a kind of confusing one from that perspective. Um I think an important factor in that kind of price and value thing is that you've tended to invest large amounts of money in players because of the captaincy. So that's another role in those more expensive players. Um, and that is probably less of a factor than it has been in previous seasons because of the Perma Harland captaincy. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a tricky one to kind of wrap your head around and probably... One that's quite difficult to um, kind of itemize and break down on a very granular level because players are constantly oscillating and changing in terms of their value. So I tend not to obsess about it too much as long as you're comfortable that your players are roughly giving you what they should be for the investment you've got in them. And I guess that's where kind of Mo Salah might be a good example now of people questioning whether there is value in, in an investment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, ownership, I think, is kind of what you mean as well by captaincy too. And that, that's always, of course, a moderating factor. Like a player can be essentially not particularly valuable in, in terms of you know, the value that we were talking about, but still be a must-own. So you know, at the end of last season, I was thinking of something like Trent, for example, who was, didn't perform anyone near as well as Robertson did, but the ownership was so decent for him that if he did anything, it was an automatic sort of rank denter. It wasn't a rank destroyer, but a rank denter. Um, Gabriel Jesus this season, um, you know, we've mostly dropped him on our wild card, but you know, whenever he has returned, you've just seen kind of the rank just go just a tiny bit because the ownership has been good enough. And you know, take that to the extreme, you know, Salah last year and in the years past when he's decided to, you know, go on a bit of a run, he's scoring every game, the ownership's so high. Obviously, Holland this year, as you mentioned, and you know, players like you know, Bowen last year, like Danny Ings when he was on, on that sort of amazing run for Southampton, uh, Bruno Fernandes, uh, this kind of uh, when he well, when he first joined, so, and especially during Project Restart, um, Hazard in years past as well. And it's definitely an interesting thing just to kind of meditate on. And as you said, you know, 
price definitely is something that is still in people's minds when they think about value. That's completely true. And there's a really interesting thing in behavioral science called the price quality heuristic. Um, it's, it's really simple. It's basically the idea that you assume something because it's expensive is better than a cheaper substitute. And you naturally assume that it's better quality. So maybe that kind of talks to the idea of the return of investment that you said, I'm paying more, therefore I'm getting better for my money. Um, and that can be true in some ways. So for example, you know, if you buy, I don't know, something you're particularly engaged with, uh, I'm particularly engaged at the moment, if I paid more for a better sofa, it's probably going to last me longer than if I spent a five or a month from Gumtree. But it, it, that's not always true. So think about baked beans. Waitrose baked beans are one pound and Tesco value baked beans are 20p. Do you naturally assume that Waitrose is a better? Probably. But do they taste pretty much the same? Probably too. They don't um, taste five times better, do they? Yeah, no way. And the point is here is that we're not naturally inclined to believe that a higher price means something is better. But that's not always the case. And applying that to FPL, you know, you mentioned Salah, who we'll talk about in a bit. The other one that kind of crosses my mind at the moment, especially because we both own them, is Kevin De Bruyne. Because we both own Kevin De Bruyne at the start of this season, who was 12.0. Phil Foden is 8.2 at the moment, starts the season at 8.0. Do we think over the course of the season, De Bruyne is going to outscore Foden? Maybe. But talking to that kind of point you made earlier on about depressed time horizons and thinking about what makes sense now, Foden is clearly better value because he's 4 million or so cheaper than De Bruyne. Like the price doesn't matter so much here. It's the value you get from the respective asset. So it's one of those things we've got to be careful and think in terms of thinking, oh, you know, I've got a choice between Foden and or De Bruyne to bring in. And this will happen in countless examples throughout the course of the season. Oh, I could buy the higher price guy or the, or the smaller price guy. I could spend money on Zaha or Bowen, or I could buy Trossard. Oh, I should probably buy the higher price guy because he's a bit more expensive. Therefore, he must be a bit better. I think trying to get get away from that idea, uh, or at least being able to kind of be objective about the fact that you know, the price shouldn't mean as much as it did at the start of the season now is probably something to keep in mind. I'd agree with that. <laughs> 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 I, I think there are things that happen in a season often that change your kind of assessment of a player's value. So, for example, Foden in previous seasons we would have seen as a minutes risk and i th think minutes are quite an important facet to a player's value in terms of i mean it sounds really obvious but 90 minutes gives you a much better chance of returning than 60 minutes and we know that less than 60 minutes is an obvious disadvantage from a kind of points perspective um but yeah so for example foden that they he had that kind of perceived minutes risk um i think he's clearly been the biggest beneficiary from the way man said he have adapted to their style under harland and I don't think we'd have necessarily been able to work that out because there are a million different ways that team could have shifted to kind of make their team more focused around centre forward. And it just so happens that Foden has been the big beneficiary and he hasn't had um, that minutes risk that we expected. Um, so I think there are lots. He's just one example of a way a player, you know, things can change around them and that affects their perceived value or that their kind of potential scoring points conversely Salah for example it looks like at the moment um, Klopp is quite set on playing a 4-4-2 or a 4-2-3-1 however you want to see it and that has an implication for Salah's positioning on the pitch and therefore his kind of points threshold so I think value as we're saying in terms of diverging from price I think that happens for so many reasons and partly that's there are the, the kind of tactical factors and kind of performance factors players coming into peaks and and kind of in decline that, that we can't really foresee and so that's why value is such a kind of dynamic thing across the season and then of course you've got things like injuries and things which cause further um ruptures for that as well yeah exactly how many times did we see for example oh sal is injured by Mane straight away yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> value can is it's so dynamic it changes throughout the course of the season it is it's quite a perceptual thing so you know back in the day we did talisman theory and I also because I had more time did a, a value report too which was kind of just removing the kind of I think it was just removing appearance and then looking at that kind of the, the the value the metric you got versus the price and creating some sort of on the algorithm to do that. I don't have time for that anymore, sadly. But yeah, it's definitely a perceptual thing, isn't it? So it's a bit like a political economy or something like that. If you want to get really academic here, and um, the things which don't can't really be metricized, but they're things that you understand, like soft power, hard power, things like that. And um, 
I think also what's really interesting to bring in here, I, I mentioned kind of one behavioral idea, another one's anchoring. So that's the tendency to rely too much on the first bit of information you learn uh, to understand value of other things. So um, what do we do at the start of the season? What are we interested in? We're probably interested in who the most expensive player is, the premiums. They're, they're the ones that really catch our eye. Um, but against those premiums, we measure everything else and have kind of a mental map of how valuable things are um, judging by that. A real world example is if you go shopping for something, say, you know, electronics, uh, say I'm going to go and buy a TV. Um, you go into the shop or you look online and if you haven't done your prior research, the first TV you see, the first price you see, will be the one that you base your knowledge of if other TVs are priced well or not on. So, you know, you, you'll, you'll kind of think, oh, first, it's normally a bit of a subconscious, a non-conscious thing. Um, but you'll go around the TV store and you'll find, oh, do they even exist anymore? I'm sure they don't. Maybe the, the John Lewis, whatever it is section. Um, yeah, I'm sure John Lewis must still have that. Yeah, yeah, they must do. They must do for the oldies. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you'll judge everything by the first bit of information that you got as whether this is good or this is bad. And in terms of pricing and store managers also tend to place units they want to shift at the front of the store too, to just make them look even better. Um, but in terms of pricing, in terms of anchoring, yes, we look at the premium players and a lot of the time we kind of judge the price structure based on those players. But I guess that kind of makes an interesting question this season because how is value important when the price structure is currently a bit out of bog? You've got Salah and you've got Trent, the upper echelons of the defender midfielder value scale just misfiring and not really seeming worth it. And really, you know, we've got one Musto in Holland. You've got the second kind of premium slot wide open, haven't you? Because you've got Kane, who's, I think he's only blanked once Kane, hasn't mm. quite got the fanfare thus far, and a bit awkward if you want to move your structures around. Um, you've got Kevin De Bruyne, who's ticking along, but has a very, very valid substitute, good, which is cheaper, the Tesco mm. value baked bean, which is Phil Foden. So it's quite an interesting one, isn't it, to think about. I mean, from a data point of view, I guess it, things have changed, haven't they, a little bit from when the prices first came out. And maybe we're getting to the point, Lucy, where we might not need to spend it all coming up, you know? I, I think I'm coming around to that idea, particularly when we're thinking about game week 12. And that's probably what's forced this kind of question a bit more because we're obviously looking at the likes of KDB and saying, oh, do I... That I would have normally switched him out for Salah, but is that actually a kind of worthwhile thing? And I'm, I'm sure there's kind of questions about that. But I th I think it's difficult to work out on the basis that there are kind of lots of different ways you could tackle it. So you could switch down your premium to, say, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking of KDB, for example. You could switch him down to Trossard, um, yep. who's got a very nice fixture, Forest in Gaming 12. It it couldn't it doesn't even need to be a long term thing because I guess the thing is once you drop out of that premium category you've got a bit more flexibility in terms of options so it, it could be like a short term thing so you could leave money in the bank and I think what's interesting about that idea is that it means that you could do traditional kind of what we would call two move funds swaps so you know you're talking about like restruct shifting money from one category to another you wouldn't need to do that anymore because you could just have this little float fund that just followed you around and it would make life a lot more flexible and you could do um kind of nice easy transfers one week to another and i think that would probably help you from a kind of defending points from a kind of um transfer point of view because you don't have to look at minus minus fours or anything like that um i think there's also the possibility that you could use it to beef up your bench until the world cup so if we think that injuries are likely to be an issue because there's a lot of fixed congestion particularly for the bigger clubs you could use some of the money to beef up say your first bench option and then you would also have less pressure on transfers from that perspective because you know that even if you got an injury you would have um, a perfectly suitable person on the bench um so i think there's lots of different ways of looking at it um i certainly wouldn't feel tied at the moment to a premium because as we've said there isn't an obvious one um firing apart from harland and the fact is as i kind of mentioned earlier harland is also a perma captain at the moment so you're not even thinking about whether you can leverage value on a captaincy. Um, of course, the the only kind of counterpoint to this is game week 12, where obviously we can't captain Haaland. And you, I think one thing people have to evaluate is whether they still think Salah is the the optimum, the kind of the best possible captaincy option, because your captaincy in game week 12 probably has 
a more influential kind of opportunity than your typical captaincy will because we will just see that Harland, I would expect we'll see that Harland captaincy ownership divert in so many different directions. Um, so I would be tending to not worry about value too much, but just think about kind of the best possible captaincy that week, regardless of how much they cost, really. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I would say that maybe value is less important. Um, and I think probably lastly, it's important to acknowledge that I think it's likely a premium comes to the fore at some point. I don't know if that'll be before the World Cup, but I feel like even after the World Cup, we'll need to race, reset our expectations to a certain extent because there's such a gap there that all of the information we had before might not be as relevant as it was. So I don't know. I've, I kind of sat on the fence there, but I, I don't think that at the moment two premiums is as obvious as it seemed to us when we were making our teams in game week one. No, nor when we wildcard this in game week seven no, or eight. No, true. Um, no. We, we've got a good question actually on this. I'm just going to bring that up so we can answer it. Well, we have, you've already answered it, but uh, Tepar and Gil said, you know, the one, two tr premium strategy works to, the links to your discussion. So what do we do now? We've got a perma capsule on our hands, which is exactly what you just discussed a little bit. I mean, it's definitely, it's, it's just, it's fascinating really just to think about because it's a perceptual thing, really, in terms of that game week 12 captain. Because if you bring in Trossard, who's at home to Nottingham Forest for De Bruyne, and you've got no Haaland or something like that, I guess you'd be captaining Trossard if you don't have another premium. And I know a lot of people would be incredibly uncomfortable with that. Just, it's not really a rational thing. It's kind of just having that safety associated with captaining a premium. And most people, I think a lot of people will bring Salah in just because he's a premium who has a decent fixture on paper in West Ham. And maybe that is the most significant kind of example of price quality here, as I spoke about earlier on, in effect, because people will see there's two options here. And obviously the captain has kind of a, a greater sense of endowment in terms of FPL. There's a, a greater sense of importance attached to it. I think people will kind of look at these two and kind of make a price decision rather than one perhaps it's necessarily value because I mean, Trossard's yeah, always good, always good value that guy. Um, and maybe, yes, it it's worth kind of changing our anchors if we can, uh, would probably be my point, um, just because it's kind of not working at the moment with the likes of Trent, likes of Salah. Um, I did have a look at a few, I, I did kind of look at a few bits and pieces uh, with Salah and it's, it's fascinating really. Like, He's still fifth for non-pen XGI, which, which is okay. I mean, that's good. Um, but looking back on that, the price quality stuff, his non-pen XG is matched by Callum Wilson, who costs £5.5 .5 million less, slightly better by Mitrovic, who is £5.8 million less, and Foden uh, is, is better than him as well for £4.5 million less. So, um, and Gabriel Jesus, who's £4.7 million less, uh, has a 33% better non-pen XG of the season. And Almiron, who costs £7.6 million less than Salah, is just 0 0.2 non-pen XG behind the Egyptian king. So, I mean, yeah, I'm cherry-picking examples, of course, and I'm not saying that Salah will be in, in the bin all year. But I think the biggest impact of what we've seen thus far is that there's going to there's less fear about not owning Salah than I, than I can remember, or at least in the time I've been properly looking at it. And I presented Salah versus Trossard because honestly, I think that that's kind of the decision I'm going to be making. Like in years gone by, in months gone by, even that would have been lunacy to be saying, hey, you know what? I've got Trossard on an equal plane to Mo Salah in terms of who I'm going to bring in and captain. But at the moment, it kind of it kind of feels like I'm I'd be kind of tempted to look at Trossard over Salah. And I think that especially, maybe that's a way. Yeah, especially for the flexibility it earns you after game week 12. So instead of having all of that money locked up, you can instantly look at like your next transfer. So if you were say, you know, anxious about getting Saka or Foden back in, or in for the first time, depending on who you are, um, that would give you a lot more flexibility to kind of instantly jump on that. Whereas Salah's a bit more awkward. I mean, obviously you could just take his slot back out. Um, but I think there is certainly merit in that. Um, I do wonder to a certain extent how much, and this sounds like a right mouthful, um, but subconscious expective effective ownership um, <laughs> is playing 
XEO, in, yes. Yeah, yeah, XEO is playing in, in kind of Sal- Salah's favour. I wonder if, whether, yeah, as I say, subconsciously or consciously, people's expectations that Salah will be bought en masse for obvious reasons. Um, I wonder if that also enters into the equation. I'm not saying it should, um, but I wonder in terms of, you know, we're, we're talking about feeling safe with a player. There is also that factor in it. I wouldn't expect that Trossard will have a significant uh, number of owners or, or well, I mean, it'll be boosted by the captaincy, but I wouldn't expect him to be a huge rank threat. Whereas it may be that people are worried that Salah could turn into that if um, a lot of people jumped on him. Uh, it's really difficult to tell because his effective ownership is so low at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, and then that, I, I think we're kind of vaguely answering Alex Ball's question, how do you plan to, to navigate the blank now? Uh, to some extent, I mean, we'll come back to it a bit later, maybe. But I mean, that might be the beauty of a split pin week then. As you said, you've got all that kind of the, the vacuum cleaner, uh, the, the EO vacuum that is Holland has disappeared for a week. Yeah. And then you've just got no idea how the dust is going to settle to extend the metaphor. And I think that, that probably lends itself to being like, well, actually, let me plan for the longer term here. So as you said, you can pull all your resources into Salah from your KDB. We've both got KDB funds uh, that we've kind of, so we had KDB plus 0.6 or whatever it was uh, to move um, Salah back in if needed, thinking, oh, yeah, you know, game week 12, yeah, I'm sure he'll be needed then. Now, looking at the you know, the data in front of you, the eye test as well, well the, data, the data's still okay, uh, but the eye test is in terms of how Liverpool are playing. Now, the guy was hooked in one of the biggest games of the season this weekend. Um, I I just didn't I did not register that he was on the pitch to be honest until he got subbed off, um, and you know sometimes you have got to look at those things. But I mean you're right, another premium is going to emerge at some point. And I saw Flapjack on Twitter said earlier on that all it's going to take is a penalty and for him to kind of backside and assist, and suddenly he's going to be in everyone's team. So it's definitely kind of at that point at the moment where there's loads of questions, and I think people will be looking to. Know, find something to latch on to to give a solution it's just mm-hmm. about how you weigh up the sense of value within that or whether you get carried along by the tide because if, if Salah does start going and Liverpool do start kind of going I mean I mean, they fix us up until the World Cup aren't that terrible apart they've got Man City obviously next um, which we're not going to be touching them for in game week 15 I think it's Spurs but other than that mostly kind of winnable games I think there's not there's an Oscar Forest game isn't there somewhere or other I think maybe yeah. I'm going to say game week 13 and so, I mean, maybe perhaps the EO would would bump up a little bit for that. I just, I don't know. Uh, it's one of those where I, I kind of feel like it's um, really bringing in this idea of value a little bit. I and mean, this year he hasn't provided value. I know the models have, are always are going to love Salah, but it just doesn't seem worth it at the moment. Um, and I think that that's what's really important. And that's what's really interesting as well when you think about what you can do next. Oh, well. So yeah, value as a concept, Lucy. It definitely still some semblance of price going on, but I think mostly we're beginning to see now as the season has started to unfold that some players are kind of providing decent value for money and others aren't. And I really wonder, I, I can't quite remember this happening in the past. I'm sure it won't. I'm sure a Kane, I'm sure a Salah. I, I, I've got a memory of United's fixtures being very good Um both sides with the World Cup. So maybe a Bruno or something yeah, like that yeah. stepping forward. Uh, maybe that will happen. But if it's a Bruno, that's a cut price premium. I just wonder whether we're going to be in a situation. I think it was, was it the Josh King year or something like that. Uh, when, you know, when he was just a, a must own for a while and suddenly we were all wandering around with four or five million in the bank. I wonder whether it would be one of those years where, as you said, we've got those little kind of cash floats and things. Um, and maybe that flexibility and maybe the, the appreciation of what value is. Um, will be something which will kind of start to dawn on people over the course of the year, especially when you've got your kind of established anchor and Salah just becoming less and less viable. But hey, who knows? He's definitely going to score a penalty or two against Man City and be everyone's player of the week, isn't he? <laughs> that would be a cat amongst the bigger pigeons. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so yeah, value. Interesting subject, that's for sure, especially when you try to apply it to what's going on in FPL at the moment. Right, let's take a break there and come back. Uh, We will talk about game reviews, mid-leagues, sort of updates, market forces, and some questions too. Back in a sec. 
Right, so we're back, and it's time to do the game reviews. Um, obviously, the game week is actually still going. Um, I think uh, Forest and Villa are just about to kick off the recording a little bit early because you know, I've got to get off a little bit early tonight. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think, as we said at the start, anything tonight's going to move the needle too much. So, uh, Dr. Heiner, how did you get on this week? I have 75 points all out, um, which at the moment is taking me to 52k um, up from 77 so that's a decent gain um, I won't go into too much detail because we have identical teams and I don't want to make this too boring for people um, but basically obviously the highlights were Cancelo which we fortunately both had I think that was probably the decisive factor for a lot of people as to whether you had a good or a bad week yeah um, yeah a James one pointer, a Pope two pointer. Pope has been a, a staggering disappointment. I think it's <laughs> fair to say. I saw Randy Shafter refer to him as a Pope Ponzi scheme, which you know doesn't seem that far off, really. Um, Trippier seven pointer keeps keeps coming up with the goods, even when they don't keep a clean sheet, which is excellent. Uh, KDB got us that nice little assist. Well, less nice for me watching it as a Saints fan, but what can you do? Mm -hmm. um, Madison, I think, was bought on mass and disappointed. He only got that one pointer. Martinelli obviously did very well. And I think that was probably another one where some people had started to move on, um, thinking against, um, again, against game with 12. We've, we've been quite insistent that you should keep with him because he offers great value. So I guess he'll be staying. Um, Zahar, five pointer, again, this is where we differ, so I'll let you share the good news about Bowen. Um, Tony five pointer, Pereira coming in for Mitrovic and Haaland, everybody's captain. That's about it. Yeah, so um decent, decent progress, not amazing progress. I I'd be quite happy with this start if it wasn't for you. So <laughs> over to you, Tom. Yeah, I just have, I've only, it's only two two points more for Bowen. It's only seven points for the penalty. I think, oh was, no! Yeah, so it was it was it, was, it wasn't loads and loads. I think it was just last last week. So. Uh, fortunate assist and the goal um has been the difference yeah no same as you the same ish as you 77 um yeah madison uh, was a, a bit annoying for us but not as annoying as it was for the few people who texted me or at least wrote on group chats afterwards oh i sold martinelli for madison this week Ouch. gulp that's that's really that's a bit of a killer isn't it and and holland being quiet was great because I saw loads of people in you know, group chats and on social media saying I'm going to triple caps him this week. Um, had a 200 percent effective ownership um, where I was, so I didn't want him to do anything. To be honest, yeah, so 201 where I am. Yeah, I this is the first. I think that is the first time this season where effective ownership has has got me. Um, where where I've, I've had that. I think. Right? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, because I think there was that hat trick against Crystal Palace when everyone else had captain Salah, right? So yes. yeah, so so yeah, this is the first week the effective ownership has really the, the ugly side of effective ownership has really got us. But luckily, it's been ten weeks, so I mean that was, that's been quite a nice little run. I'm sure um, it won't be this way for a little while, especially with the Liverpool game coming up. I'm sure people will have uh, seen all sorts. I've seen you know people like saying I'm selling Holden for Kane and all this sort of. Jazz and yeah, very, very, very um, strange. And yes, uh, 77 for me. I also had Andreas off the bench for Mitrovic and decided not to make a move this week. Um, and Bohm of the pen um, was obviously quite nice. And I think what interests me about that, and again, just being slightly self indulgent, is that in prior seasons, Lucy, I would have sold Mitrovic for somebody else. I'm sure I would have. I'm sure I would have kind of gone, oh, you know what? I'm not sure whether we be back. So I'm going to get him out for you know, Welbeck or something. And I'd be depriving myself of one, a transfer, and two, um, the Andreas points off the bench. So maybe I'm improving, or maybe it's just one of those seasons where I've just gotten horrendously lucky. Um, nonetheless, um, in terms of luck, I do find myself on top 10K. I think I'm probably going to end up around kind of 9K after... All, all said and done i'm sure there'll be someone out there with like a watkins or something like that um yeah um very nice uh did not expect that uh, i think about two points in inside or something like that so it's obviously very happy um but it will never last is, is my opinion on that and yeah I'm, I'm sure i can find a way to blow up my team over the next few weeks that's what i'm okay, saying week 12 captaincy is waiting for you yeah that trossard's captaincy is gonna <laughs> gonna gonna absolutely burn isn't it i'm just not looking forward to that but yeah no, it's, it's nice to be in top 10k i just just not a big fan of the old i, I always said to myself right because you know, after years and years of doing this if i ever did do well i'm not going to be an insufferable 
If people have criticised me for the season that I did do well, apparently I didn't make enough of a big deal about it. No, I just, I just much prefer that. No, um, it I, just feels I, awkward. I'm not. And I'm also, not, if it starts to go wrong, literally everyone is watching because you've yeah. alerted them to it. To it. I, I'm not knocking people who are doing well and I'm um, like, you know, correctly celebrating it. It's just not my style. Put it that way. Um, maybe I should be doing it for numbers, clout, growth, and all this sort of thing. But it just feels a bit. It makes me feel a bit queasy. So yeah, never do it. But yeah. Good start to the season. I don't think I'd have. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd think that you'd have gotten very long odds of me being in the top 10k um, in uh, six uh, by game week 10. All right, uh, let's move on to the market forces. Obviously, the game week is still ongoing, but nonetheless, I don't think that anything today is going to particularly move the needle in terms of, well, maybe people would sell NECA. <laughs> so maybe people would see that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, Patrick will have a big impact. As well. Yeah, maybe, maybe actually, you're right. So, what are we seeing? We are seeing people responding to the game week and forgetting that there's a blank in game week twelve. Oh no! Phil Foden brought in by almost three hundred thousand managers at the time of recording the top transfer in second. Joao Cancelo brought in by one hundred seventy five thousand. I mean, managers. to be fair, they do have Liverpool next, so you can see the motivation. <laughs> Yeah, can I understand that completely easy fixture. Um, Trippier, yeah. 163,000 managers. Okay, I understand that. Um, yeah, seven point hero. Um, now up to 5.6. So if you got him in pretty early, you're looking at point three, uh, point three tr- uh, profit right now, which is pretty good. Uh, Trossard, 151,000 transfer for him. I've um, already heard this pod in advance, I'm sure. And Martinelli in fifth. So again, he's done some goals. Got Leeds next. So Miss Lee did very well against them last year. 130,000 transfers in for the Brazilian. Transfers out, shockingly dominated by Liverpool. Uh, Trent, lots of reports that he may uh, be out for a little while. We don't know yet. It looks a bit nasty in terms of where his ankle went again in the Arsenal game. Uh, 270,000 transfers out for Trent. I'm guessing a lot of people um, have gone for either the, stro- the straight swap to Cancelo, they cost the same now, or down to Trippier. Uh, Luis Diaz, who um, it was been reported today, is out of the World Cup. Won't be back into went back on the train pitch till December. Uh, 250,000 transfers out for the Colombian. 184,000 out- transfers out for Salah. Um, so Liverpool uh, attackers, uh, erstwhile FPL darlings, operating uh, occupying the top three sales. Uh, Salah down to twelve point seven now. I don't think you'd have had you'd have had very long odds on him falling that far by this point, wouldn't you? Yeah, and we kept that fund thinking that he'd stay put as well, didn't we? I know, I know. Maybe a blessing in disguise in terms of freeing up funds elsewhere later on. We'll discuss that in a bit. Um, Mitrovic, one hundred twenty-three thousand transfers out for him. I guess you know people are. People have seen enough and want to get, I don't know who the, who the main forward coming in is actually. Solanke, Ooh. obviously. I think it's t- I think it's like Tony and Jesus. It's, it's very, yeah. It's, it's oh, not... more Jesus. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. People what... really aren't looking at game week 12, are they? I don't really know what the poor lambs are doing. And, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 as long as Mitro's fit, I hugely recommend that people keep selling him. I mean, obviously, yeah. all of you listening, I'm, I, I know that I'm joking, but please put the message out. Sell Mitrovic ahead of Bournemouth and, and Villa oh, at home. He's a huge injury risk now, isn't he? Yeah, please do that. And also, Bernardo being sold, Bernardo Silva, this is being sold by 100,000 managers. I, I'm not really too sure why 100,000 managers did have Bernardo Silva in the first place, but there you bloody well go. Hmm. Always makes me just despair sometimes when I see uh, the early reactions, especially when you've got a big event coming up in the market it's forces. It's bewildering sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. But hey, you know, we're all in the know here. It's fine. <laughs> Moving on to the the uh, mini league this week. Uh, up top it is Lewis Gamby, um, who, oh, and this is where my phone crashes, of course. This will be edited out of the main podcast, of course. Um, top of the league this week is Lewis Gamby, uh, who got 67 points. Um, he tops the league by 11 points, so he's kept the t- kept the top for a little while. I think he actually joined last week, and I think that he um, made me close the league because I thought, you know what, I don't want. I, I, I kind of feel like you know we're we're at game week 10 now. It's probably a good point to close the league, so it is close to new entries. Um, Lewis is now top, and in second it is Jonathan Arkless. Um, I think his his team name is my fucking it's fucking crashed again. <laughs> oh, so annoying. That's an unusual team name. Yeah, <laughs> that's a terrible name. And um, yeah, in second, John 
In second, Jonathan Arkless, Robin Hill, up from third to second. Uh, Jonathan's been in and around the top 10 for quite a while. 71 points to Jonathan this week. Uh, got his, uh, uh, basically, a similar, very, very similar team to us, except he's got Foden over KDB. In third, uh, Bryce Lear makes his return to the top five with Dividend, Dividendino United. 75 points for Bryce this week. Uh, a few kind of uh, a mixture of you know, like Satoni, Jesus, Saha, etc., etc. Down from second to fourth, it's Dag Inga Stenhow, Stenhow United, just 62, unfortunately, this week for Dag Inga. In joint fifth this week, it is Slothin Powers Unite, Rowan Usenbrug, and Jan Tan Leatherit, Robin Smith, 78 for Rowan, and a big 90 for uh, for Robin. And, and he had Saka and Martinelli, which is the big difference for him. They managed to just pull out a 90 points this week following, um, yes, uh, that Arsenal double up really coming up trumps. In seventh, it's Hain Turan U with Team Chan, 75 points this week. In eighth, it's Eric Juna, uh, Peaky Blinders of 78. And in ninth, Goat Robert Barlow of 86. And down for, and down to 10th, it's back of Veneto finally, Henry Deem, just 66 points this week. But uh, this is before um, all of the auto subs are brought on. So maybe things will change a little bit. Nonetheless, well done, everybody. And uh, yeah, keep it up. You're doing very, very well, especially because. Getting close to 700 points by game week 10. That's pretty damn good going. Right, so let's move on to the questions and we'll move on to our teams after that. Uh, quite a few questions out there this week. I know we've started to slightly touch on them. We've already answered one, which I spoke about earlier from Clipper and Gill. And um, the next one, I think, is one that we kind of started answering, but not quite. So Sam FPL Pricey, a friend of the pod, says, you know, pretty obvious question. But what do we do with the Mo Salah shaped hole in our teams? <laughs> I mean, if you if you have him, I guess you've got to keep him, haven't you, Lucy? Um, and in our situation, then you know we've we've really said you move on. But, but let's look at it from a position of someone who went with him on game week nine wild card. You, you've got to keep him now, haven't you? Surely. You probably have. I think if you have more than three of Arsenal and City then you almost certainly have to. I think if you've got no other fires and no other issues, then maybe you don't. But it doesn't feel like a very efficient use of transfers to start messing about with him now. So, and yeah, I kind of feel like you might have to stay there. But I am also a big fan of the idea that plans, going back to what we were talking about last week, should be quite flexible in FPL. And I think we should be able to respond to what's going on. I think if you make your planning too fixed... FPL can quite quickly feel quite intimidating and you can feel compelled to keep or buy someone that you're not all that sold on. Um, so if you don't have anything else you need to do with your team and you are happy that it is very well set for game week 12, I don't think it's ridiculous to get rid of him. But if it was me and I had Salah, I know that I'd be keeping him. That's the honest answer. Yeah, no, I I probably would be as well, um, because he does sort out your problem in game week twelve. He's mm. perhaps not the right answer. He might end up being the right answer. You know, he might be inspired uh, by. I think Diaz, if Diaz is out, it, it maybe may change the how Klopp sets up once more. Cause he played the Fab Four, didn't he, uh, this weekend? Just gone. So it might change, and you know, we may see some sort of new formation being deployed, which will solve all manner of things, but. I think you do have to keep hold of him at the moment. And as we said I do earlier, if the Diaz injury might force Klopp to think about things slightly differently and he might switch away from this new system. You know, Trent was also, they thought that they were doing 4 4 2 to kind of keep Trent back and change that around. So maybe with these injuries and the subsequent impact it has on lineups and formations and things, that might make Salah seem like a more attractive option. So I guess that's one thing to keep an eye out for this week. I mean, you're not in a position where you're going to have to decide right now, I wouldn't imagine. So you can probably hold on one more week and see what happens because you're not going to want to buy a City player for Game Week 12 anyway. So you may as well have one more week to get more information in kind of response to these injuries and then work from there. But yeah, I, I, I don't think I'd honestly be getting rid of him, even though I'm not really sold on the idea. Yeah, it just does. It just seems a bit odd that how it's been set up this year and if, if looking at loads of the of data points around in terms of this like this season you've got darwin bobby Luis diaz all getting kind of more 
that higher XG chances than Salah has. Mm. And if you'd have previously posited that Salah's probably one of the best finishers in the team, I mean, obviously volume striker and all of that, whereas um, Mane was famously more kind of you know, better at conversing those low SG chances. It just seems a bit of flabbergasting, really, that you've ended up with Salah playing this sort of provider role. Um, hopefully that will change. As you said, maybe the Diaz injury will force a rethink. But as it stands, I mean, I think we'll probably answer your problem, your question a bit more, Sam, in terms of what you do with the the hole in the team. In terms of if you've got all that money to spend, you've got KDB in there. I, I just don't, I just don't think at the moment um, he's looking like he's going to be coming in for me in game week twelve. I really don't. Uh, we'll get back on that in just a bit. Next question actually stays with Liverpool and it covers Trent a little bit. So desperate, desperately seeking Duzan asks, and he's not. In, I'm not entirely sure whether he's serious or tongue in cheek, but he asks, could Liverpool be best defensively if Trent is ruled out for a while? Well, what do you think, Lucy? Taking the man out of the firing line, obviously an enforced uh, taking him out of the firing line, it seems. But I mean, could that be beneficial to him? Do you think? I mean, Trent is having a bad season, and I think it's well documented. But I don't think he's alone in having a bad season in that in that Liverpool defence. And I think it's reasonable to suggest that Gomez comes in and he's also had pretty bad games, notably in the Champions League. Um, he Martinelli was having quite a lot of success making the same runs off the back of Gomez as he was Trent. Um, so I'm kind of quite sceptical as to whether a change really makes that much difference to them. I, I do recognise that that channel was a problem for them, um, but I don't think it was the only problem for them defensively. So... No, I I don't think it makes a huge, huge difference to them defensively. I have limited confidence that they could keep City out. I mean, are they really going to do that? I don't think so. Um, the, I guess the fixtures get better, so yeah. But I, I don't really know what bearing it has on FPL, actually, if you don't have Trent, because I can't see you investing in, say, Van Dijk reliably confidently at this point um Robertson's obviously out of the picture at the moment so yeah even if it did I don't know if that would have any implications for FPL I just yeah I mean I as you said are you going to be investing in Van Dyke at the moment probably not where the at the moment it looks like the the trend of investment is going and is into that midfield the week a couple of weeks ago we were saying oh the midfield's rubbish <laughs> that, now, now, now all of the eight min, million midfielders that we got excited about are suddenly all scoring points so. yeah, and, and now we just want three five two and i think i'm fairly sure everybody and their dog has got james trippier cancello as the back three <laughs> so it's just one well, of those part, actually, we shouldn't be insensitive because some people have got trent instead of cancello haven't they? true true um but yeah i mean i'm sure that might change a little bit but now i think we're probably looking at keeping cancello aren't we to some extent especially with with, with walker being out yeah yeah he didn't play on the right but you no know, a kanji just basically made into a back three didn't he and yeah, cancello, yeah. Cancello, off you go off mate you go, yeah <laughs> do what you want um so, I mean, in terms of impacts on FPL, it's, it's probably going to be negligible, isn't it? Like, yeah, um, that's, uh, that's it. But, I, I mean, wouldn't even be looking at them, if I'm honest. No, Liverpool's run's okay. It's, a, it's all right. It's, it's not the most like investable in terms of... They're just not an investable team in terms of the defence at the moment. And you need those clean sheets for defenders. Um, I mean, if Robertson comes back, perhaps it might be more a bit more interesting. I, d I just don't know what Klopp's going to do um, either way. Mo Salah right wing back and I'm sure the models will still insist that he's he's worth uh, a must or something like that who knows right uh, next question Bryn Stewart um, he says I know it's reactionary but what do we think about good team players versus bad team players especially when bad team players have good fixtures um, so he says he's thinking about you know those exciting sort of mid price midfielders we were speaking about before now I'm not 100% sure what trying to interpret that question uh, what that what you what you mean exactly? I think I think find... he's comparing good team so say good a good team player being Foden or Saka, for example, in the yeah. same category as a Madison and a Zaha in the same category, how we should compare those two, knowing that your good players in the commas can are probably a bit more fixture resistant than your bad players. Is that that's what how I understood it. Okay. Okay. So you're looking at basically talisman theory versus yeah versus cogs, in, cogs in the machine cogs in the unstoppable machine. Um, on this at the moment, I think it's very difficult to evaluate because Saka and Foden are basically taken out of the picture until post game week twelve. So 
I, in terms of in immediate transfers, I, I don't think there's a lot to be said in terms of posing one against the other. Um, I think Zaha, Madison, Trossard are all interesting options. Almiron's in a completely different category. And I don't know if I'd be looking at that with a transfer because it doesn't feel especially efficient. Um, but at the moment, yeah, it's all the te- the game because of that postponement is bent towards the bad team players. And as long as they have good fixtures and you're comfortable with those fixtures, I don't see any point, any problem with investing in them. And I think Madison and Bowen have both illustrated that if fixtures are there and you are a talisman, you will tend to do quite well. I mean, not to the extent we expected. Madison's kind of gone way beyond that with that game against Forest, but I think those are those are fine, and I I don't see any problem with investing in them in, at a time when, as I said, those two other players are taken off the table. Um, obviously, Josh is no longer a midfielder. Diaz is injured, so it's pretty much just those two versus the rest. I think. Mm. No, it's, it's definitely as you said, it's, it's all about that kind of talismanship and. Even though the fi- the fixtures do tend to generate form, there's less of a guarantee with those players, as we saw with uh, with Madison against Bournemouth, ambled around the pitch a bit a bit confusedly and got a yellow card, didn't they? That kind of seemed like the 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 skinny of that particular performance. But um, you have to be kind of just taking the gamble that the fixtures do create that form, and if you know the player does tend to. If the goal is scored, the talisman's likely to be involved in some way, shape, or form. Like, I remember, um, you know, when I was doing my wild cards, I had Bowen in there. People were kind of saying, "Well, you know, I can't. Why would you buy this guy? That the data's not there. There's nothing there to support it." And admittedly, you know, he's been quite lucky. He's got a penalty and he's got an assist. But the fixtures were there mm. in order for that pick to make sense. And I know, I mean, you're never kind of saying, "Oh, you know, I'm going to take an out there punt on someone rubbish." But I admit the armor is doing very well this year, uh, but nonetheless, like you know, you're not taking that. It's an educated kind of punt that, yes, over the last eight weeks this has happened, but that does not mean there's no room for improvement. You know, you can't just write off a player after a few bad games. I admit we've done that with Salah, but you know, and um, you, you can't quite do that. Whereas if you've got a Foden or something like that, you have to kind of be more aware of the fact that you are kind of not getting the talisman. You're kind of getting a player who may or may not be involved there's that kind of there's, there's a, le- a lower sense of security about the player being involved in the goal but there's a better sense of security about their team doing well as it were which one would i prefer probably you prefer the talisman wouldn't you i think if you think that you're going to be buying the talisman for the big club so you'd be buying the, the Holland or something like that who is going to be the hauler um or you'd be buying a salad uh, for liverpool so you wouldn't buy a diaz or something like that um versus you know a player who hogs all the points. I mean surely that's kind of the one you'd be looking for, I think. I mean I've I've said I've got Madison, I've got Bowen at the moment. I do want I do want Foden, but you know, it's it's one of them. I think I want a blend of them. That's the most city on the fence I'll Of course you of course you do. Um but I feel like with those kind of talisman players and you, you were quite rightly saying kind of fixtures generate form as much as I like to use the word i don't know to use the word but you think to generate points effectively for those if the assumption therefore is that you need to use say we have a talisman slot in our team if you need to use that to navigate fixtures the likelihood is you're going to need to sort of hop that along fairly regularly whereas i'm kind of of the opinion that those cogs in the machine the fodens the sackers the martinelli's the kind of cheapish players in good teams i would tend to believe you need to hold on to those for a bit longer because there isn't the kind of particularly for someone like Foden there isn't the guarantee that they'll start there may be off games you know you're kind of tapping into a team so I think you have to accept a bit of irregularity there so you hold them over a longer term and see that pay off I think Martinelli's a great example of that because he has kind of trickled along his points but occasionally he's gone missing that's quite common I think with those players so I think I'd have them as my kind of ever presence and then my talisman with a bit more rotation, probably, with kind of a monitoring that spot. Obviously, with the nature of free transfers, you can't do that with the whole of your midfield. So you kind of need to find a balance between the two, is roughly how I'd kind of summarise it, I think. Oh, be balanced, be straightforward, make the obvious moves. A classic high net, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah. 
Yep. All right. Speaking of classic Heiner, FPL banger. He's got a question for Lucy. He asks, do we need Bowen versus Southampton? Would you prioritize um, buying him over Zaha for Leicester? He says, it's hard to read Saints. You were great against Chelsea, but you've been pretty bang average since. So Bowen versus Southampton to target. Um, what would you say to that? Um, I think it's pretty clear that Saints haven't been as good since the injury to Romeo Lavia. And that happened during that reference Chelsea game. Um, so I think you can draw a pretty, pretty strong um, link between that happening and us looking quite poor, particularly a bit more vulnerable vulnerable defensively because it's basically meant that Ward Prowse needs to do a lot of the kind of holding work in midfield, which he's not really, you know, he's not used to being a single pivot. Um, but that said, I've got significantly more faith in Bazunu than I have Ward. So there's, there's that point there. Um, I think my my general point on my kind of my general conclusion on this is that neither Zaha nor Bowen are must own this week. Both would be quite nice to own in an ideal world. You'd have both, but I don't think they're like you know this is the fixture that, that will define your season or they're going to have a mega haul in. Um, often our games West Ham are quite tight. We basically played them for a nil nil last season. It was pretty ugly and horrible, but. You know, we're no strangers to trying to basically just squash the game with really defensive, boring football. Um, so with that in mind, given that I can't really divide the fixtures, I tend to take a longer view on them. And I think Zahar's fixtures swing it for me just based on game week 12 more than anything else. Um, so over the next four, Zahar's look better than, than Bowen, who has Liverpool and Man United, if I'm not wrong in saying um, so that's where I'd go with that one. I'd, I very rarely like judging two players and splitting them on one fixture because I'm boring like that. I'm very sorry. That makes a lot of sense, though. I mean, you, you basically have two like-for-like players in a lot of ways. Like yeah, talisman both for... penalties, talisman, yeah. So, and then one has just happened to have started the season at 8.5, another one um, a little bit cheaper. Really similar in terms of the expected data as well. So Bowen's X, uh, XG... Uh, non pen XG that is 1.9 Zaha's is 2 <laughs> it's just got slightly more XA Mr Zaha look I mean it's it's definitely one that as you said you probably need to take a, a longer time horizon about because I mean, Ward is I, I'm sure I could be a better goalkeeper than Ward at times um, and that star jump thing at the weekend what was that all about wannabe Schmeichel I suppose um, I can <laughs> see where he was coming from but it's it's definitely yeah Poor guy, um, but no, no, I, mean, I don't know. You have Bowen, so maybe you have a different view on it. No, no, I, I, I think the thing is with Bowen, like, he was taking, a, he, he's, I think he took, I think he's taken the most shots this weekend of any mid, of any midfielder. It's, it's sort of coming with him a little bit. It's just those moments last season where the low, the low kind of XG things go in hasn't quite swung yet. He is coming up. I think there's definitely momentum building. That's the only thing I would say about him. And I'd say the price point as well has been off-putting um, for a lot of people with Bowen because the 8.1 is quite difficult to fit in if you think, right, Madison, we've both got De Bruyne, Martinelli plus Haaland plus you know, a couple of strikers fit in that kind of template, template free. You end up looking like me with Emerson and Neko Williams. I mean, if, if, yeah, that, that, that's that, that's why I liked the idea of having Bowen because I didn't think it'd be affordable for most people. Um, if you had a, a straight up choice, I maybe think that that might be something to think about. I know it's very sort of you know quite greedy, um, but that might be something to think about. That maybe you'd be buying in a player that'd be unaffordable for other people. And frankly, I'm, Zaha over the years has hardly been the most dependable asset in FPL. No, I feel like this happens every year. I'm sure he's going to do go on a massive run now and prove me completely wrong. But there's a reason why Zaha's never really been in a fixture in most people's teams throughout the course of the season over the last, uh, what we're looking at, seven years, eight years. It's just that he's consistently inconsistent. Very, very good in the big games and very good in the tight games. But in games when I feel like he should be doing a lot, he's either very peripheral or the team comes with a way to look after Zaha. <laughs> that's kind of what I think he, he kind of, uh, that's why I've always struggled with owning him, uh, why I've always struggled with owning him. And plus the fact that he, 
I don't know whether he does it so much this season. I haven't been watching him as close as I used to, but um, he does tend to get well, he did used to tend to get wound up an awful lot and lead to a lot of yellow cards. So uh, I don't I don't know. I I I I know I know the fixtures are there. I know Palace are improving, but I just there's always something about Zaha that I just, I just never really really valued him as an FPL asset because I just thought he was he, he reminded me of Eden Hazard as I said last week just really inconsistent and infuriatingly so that you shove him in for these sorts of fixtures does not very much and then take him out of the team and then you know suddenly he's bagging a hat trick at home to to Spurs that's the sort of player he is for me which is kind of one that it's a bit like a semicolon you know you can live a long and happy life not using a semicolon if you don't understand how to use it just don't use it and it's the same as Zaha I can live a long and happy FPL career I think without him bothering me and me bothering him <laughs> oh, who knows maybe in two weeks I'll have him in my team but yeah. that, that, that's my view on that the only thing I would say in Zaha's favour is that I would agree with you that he tends to struggle in games against low blocks because he's essentially like a player who's really well suited to the counter-attack which is also subsequently why he's tended to do good well in kind of big games against like City and and teams like that the thing I would say in his favour is that he's about to play Leicester who I don't know if they can do a low block <laughs> can can they um, well, and I did... expect them to push forward which would think leave space um, particularly at home when they're under pressure and need to get results, that kind of thing. I don't see them being especially negative. So that could play in his favour. But again, that would also mean that Wolves isn't the attractive fixture in game week 12 as you think it might be because Wolves are very good at a low block and being quite awkward. And so are Everton um, in the game week 13. <laughs> they're yeah, very, maybe. very, 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 very nasty, Everton, to play against, especially with those uh, with Tarko and uh, Cody. I mean, you said yourself, would you base this decision on one game? Or would you base it over the time horizon? I know that like, on on pitch on 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 paper, West Ham's don't look great. Southampton away, as you said, struggling a little bit at the moment. Liverpool away, I know that we'd we'll be running for the hills when it comes to something like that in the past. But at the moment, hell yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to own Bowen for that. Bournemouth at home, Man nice the away, Crystal Palace at home, Leicester at home. I, that's before the uh, the World Cup. Oh, the hard I'm, does have Forest before the World Cup, which could be decisive. That is true. That's true. But I mean, and Saints. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, we'll see how it goes, shall we? But yeah, I guess it also depends. Yeah, how long you want to keep him. That's another thing to think about. Yeah. Two prize midfielders, both for like and dignity, and fair FPL. We lay our scene. Let's move on. Uh, fantasy strife. Uh, do we take out KDB this week or hold for one more? And who is the best replacement? I think we've covered that somewhat. Um, I, I, I'll just summarise. Unless you've got anything to chuck in here, Lucy. But hold for one more. I think the best replacement is actually Foden <laughs> after the blank. So all I'm doing now is basically thinking I'll indirectly replace him and have somebody else to make up the 11, like Trossard or whatever on the blank game week. I'm not sure this week it's the time to sell a big game Kev. I think that's kind of rushing things. I just don't like that idea. Yeah, I don't, also don't know, really know what it gains you by going early on it. So no, no, not like no. Brentford's an astoundingly good fixture for Trossards. That means you have to get in early. Yeah, well, so, Brentford, yeah, aren't, I... Brentford aren't defending very well at the moment. So uh, potentially on paper, it might be all right. <laughs> but they're, they're all right at home, aren't they, Brentford? I'm right in saying. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Away is probably where they're most more targeted. Yeah, I think I, so. It, it does strike me actually that this is actually far easier that we both own De Bruyne to navigate this blank than if you own Foden. Because if you own Foden, you're probably going to be less like, less wanting. Because we kind of look at Kevin De Bruyne and think, you know what, man? Yeah, perfectly happy for you to be in the team against Liverpool. And then, you know, you're out and it's easy for them to move to Foden. If you own Foden now, wow, what do you do? It's not an ideal kind of situation to move him on. Because you probably want to keep Foden. You probably want to keep, you know, Holland, Cancelo, probably Martinelli as well, if you've been keeping hold of him. Like you might be looking now at this point, you're kind of thinking, "Oh, you know, does Cancelo go on his bike for a week or something like that?" Or do I playing ten on the chin? Yeah. Maybe. Do I play with ten? That's definitely something which is coming up a lot. Probably um, not ten with Nico Williams, though. No, no. Um, but these people are probably better planners than me. Uh, let's face it, and haven't I mean, ended I, up. I've with... got him too. Yeah, have ended up trying the Neko Williams and Emerson Palmieri though. That's that's the real quiz. But um, that was your the price of Bowen, wasn't it? Really, that was the price of Bowen. Yeah. Um, 
One, uh, one. Uh, no, we've got two more. Uh, one question if we can deal with quite quickly. Uh, Jeremy HK asks, what to do with Mitrovic? Many of us with two free transfers, enough to do really this week. Should we move him on uh, because of the uncertainty about his fitness, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't think so. Let's wait and see what happens with Marco Silva. If it was Silva Eddie... seemed quite confident he would play against Bournemouth. So unless we hear otherwise, I don't see any reason that he wouldn't. Yeah, if it was Eddie Howe saying he's out for a week, I'd say <laughs> sell immediately he's out for the season. <laughs> But it's a run of Bournemouth, Villa, Leeds, Everton. So I think that's too good to pass up, really. Yep, yep. Hopefully he will actually do a goal while in my team this time, unlike the last couple of times when yeah. I owned him. Yeah, and never does it to me either. I don't know why I bought him. <laughs> Sweet FA. And finally, uh, we kind of half answered it earlier on, but Alex Ball asked how we're setting up for the blank now. Probably a good time to kind of just segue into great transfers and captains into that question. Um, because I think it's an interesting question in terms of, whether we set up for game week 12 to be good or whether we set up for the weeks after that to be good. I've been kind of mm-hmm. echoing perhaps what you were saying about Bowen versus Zaha, not, not basing it just on one week. Now, because I've got a really, really crappy pitch. <laughs> I've got um, Andreas, um, who's obviously okay, the best uh, 4.5 midfield, medium midfield we've had in uh, some time. I think we said the same on Twitter, actually. Maybe that's where I'm getting that from. Um, but he's the best 4.5 million midfield we've had for some while. Um, and then Neko Williams and Emerson. Emerson came on as a sub. Neko Williams was in bench tonight. Um, and do I rely on that for a week and carry Cancelo, Marcelli and Haaland? I think I will be. It's just whether I can do something else to kind of ameliorate things around that. Because I've got the two free transfers. I suppose I also want to look at bringing in Foden definitely in game week 13. I probably also want to move Tony, who, let's face it, has probably been a slight disappointment. I probably want to move him back to Jesus. So I this week, is it's a bit of a confusing one. And I've still got the Salah funds hanging around. And I've got those two 4.0 midfielders, defenders in Emerson and Neko, as I said. That means that for game week 12, one thing I might have to do is probably strengthen my bench now I look at it and basically commit to no mo if I do that because I'm not going to be able to do it that's the decision you're kind of making ahead of time isn't it Uh, yeah and that makes me very very uncomfortable because I'm basically closing a door to something two weeks ahead of it actually being needed um and the the obvious answer is to move Emerson because uh out or Emerson or Neko out for a web store or something from Brighton so they've got lots of forest that week um, uh, uh, Neko. Uh, the, the only thing I would kind of bear in mind is that Serge Aurier, who's replaced Neko tonight, is probably getting on a bit. Um, and the mid game week 12 is midweek, so yeah. you might you might see Neko actually play that. So for me, I probably would end up selling Emerson and keeping Neko. I don't know, it's, it's, it's a horrible situation, really. So <laughs> this this week, that's probably what I'm doing, something like that. But the big the biggie is obviously that I need to turn around and say, right, okay, I'm not going to be going with Salah. Um, for the foreseeable future, which is quite uh, potentially quite scary, especially because Diaz was the one who I thought, oh, you know, I could have him in to cover. It gets a bit yeah, difficult that was, there. That was interesting, that one. That Diaz was the one I was looking at as an alternative to Trossard. If he did downgrade a lot, I thought he might be all right to stick with. And the annoying thing is they've now taken Jotter out of the equation because he's now a striker this season. So you can't even say I'll have... Diaz's likely replacement because he's he's not in the same category. So that's that's quite annoying. Yeah. Um it's it's a tricky one. I think it's just that you're gonna have to commit to that. Whereas I've got the va- the kind of luxury of keeping it open and still replacing the wonderful Sue Fowl, who has been an absolute disaster. I thought I was paying <laughs> for a bit more security than Emerson. Turns out not. But I can't really be too bitter about it because if I had had a reliable starter i'd have probably put them ahead of um Pereira on the bench this week and i wouldn't have got those six points so you know it's one of those things um i always knew that Sufan was a bit of a problem anyway because he has liverpool so, and as bad as liverpool are i don't see west ham keeping them out so um i'm probably looking at webster maybe gehi maybe johnny you know some one of those mediocre four and a half midfield um defenders probably um not very exciting but yeah, I can keep that Salah thing open. Um, I I don't know. It's just it's weird, isn't it, having to commit to the no Salah thing so early? Yeah. I mean, even though we're both not very convinced that we want to do it. 
it's, it is is that kind of it's the fear, it's the fear, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the only the only the only Fine. other the only other thing that I was feasibly thinking of doing was maybe moving Pope to a cheaper goalkeeper, but I don't know who that is to be honest. No. I, mean, I looked at that as well. There's no really no one that I really want. I looked yeah. at Sar for a bit, but I mean, oh, I don't really like that either. No, no, I I, I, looked, I think Sar would have been the obvious would probably be the obvious one to go to ish maybe we don't know who the new manager is going to be and how they're going to set, set up there's just so many unknowns about i mean really i mean i'm potentially in burn territory because maybe i want to keep the option open yeah but... i mean that is the thing if you decide you want mo you have to burn don't you yeah or i you know force myself to make a move so i go madison to trossard this week and i say oh madison's on four free chat on four yellow cards might as well sell him i mean that feels like i'm forcing it or i do bowen to Zaha. Like a big force doesn't it doesn't sit right with me these days? No, no. it's gonna be that KDB slot. You just have to decide what you're doing with it. Yeah, yeah. I but... think you know deep down what you're doing with it. You just have to get over the psychological factor. Poss- possibly, I, it's it's more future proofing, isn't it? So as as I said, if if Salah does do something that EO starts ticking up, Liverpool start looking better with a newfangled formation that Klopp's hit on, then maybe that will be more worth it. But no. Big Those are big ifs, aren't they? If they are. If Trent's out, then you feasibly lost one of your biggest playmakers mm. because that, that's why he's Liverpool. Uh, if Diaz is out, okay, then you've got Jota, who's probably more suited for a central role, probably ending up on the left. Uh, and I, I just don't... I, I just feel like there's so many unknowns with it that maybe it, you know, maybe it is one for future me, as we said with the planning pod, to to deal with, you know, and Here deal with go. that later on. I know, <laughs> I know. Um the problem is I've done that to myself. I've done that to him so many times in the past. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Yeah, so, yeah, looking at Johnny, looking at, I don't know. Yeah, all oh, of them. I know. Oh, boring. so terrible, isn't it? But... There's nothing to get excited about, is there? Literally. No, nothing. no. I mean, I, th- I think I saw, I was looking at the data idly earlier on. I think it's like Estupinian was sort of second for XA per 90 or something like that. Like, very, very sort of ropey, tenuous stuff that you might be interested in vaguely. But hey, you know, this is basically going to be another bench sitter and potentially more money that I'm having to you know, chuck on my bench that I might might want elsewhere later on. So maybe it would end up being, you know, the cheapest possible playing defender who's got an okay game in game week 12. James Justin, I'm coming for you at 4.3. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. I might end up doing that. Right. And so obviously, you might rise, but that's the only one rise, isn't it? So it's not a helpful team. Oh, Christ. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, right. And obviously, both caps in Holland, aren't we? Oh, obviously. <laughs> obviously. I mean, if you pay, I mean, obviously, you haven't, but do you see any benefit in this kind of moving Holland for Kane business that seems to be out there? No. No. I mean, <laughs> there is a different breed of manager out there that sees merit in switching these premiums around to kind of leverage as much high ceiling pointage as you can. I'm not one of those. It seems like a, a bit of a waste of time, if I'm honest. Um, and there's all that lost value as well, which always puts me off. So, no, I don't see that. I, I did actually consider using KDB, KDB KDB, KDB to buy Kane as a kind of double swap, but it feels like the wrong move, so mm. I probably won't be doing that. Slightly over engineered, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Potentially, other moves are available, of course. Right, I think that's your lot. Hopefully, that was useful. We'll be back next week in some way, shape, or form. Now, listen, I'm in Bristol for the FPL meetup on Saturday, 15th of October. So, if you've not heard of that and fancy coming along, it's in King Street Brew House from 2 30 ish. We've got a private room, we've got the football on and table service, thanks to my friend FPL Face Off, Tom. And there, I'm I'm actually in Bristol until Monday. So, I'm seeing my nan uh, while I'm down there as well, because all my English family are from down there. So, I don't know whether, I don't think we're going to do a proper pod next week uh, on the weekend. I think we'll, I'll probably just do something very quickly on the Monday night, just let you know how we've got on any kind, any kind of key, key things that are going on and do an interim one probably on the Thursday. So that will be uh, just after game week 12 is finished. So feasibly, we're looking at a pod in two weeks time or in three weeks time in FPL wise. So yes. Uh, one of one of those sort of weird quirks of the calendar um, that just doesn't 
given the fact we're both amateur podcasters, doesn't seem worth the effort, I'm afraid, of preparing a pod properly, doing a lot of work, and then finding that within 12 hours, it's completely irrelevant. But yes, I'll keep you updated about what we're going to do. We'll keep you updated. Um, thanks for listening. We were Who Got the Assist. You can find us on Twitter at WDTA underscore FPL, and you can find me at Lucy Heinick with two Ts. If you enjoyed listening to this, please like and subscribe to the podcast. For new listeners out there, if you think you'll be coming back, please hit that five-star rating across platforms like iTunes and Spotify so more people can enjoy the pod. Thank you very much. I hope we assisted you. I hope this was vaguely valuable. Farewell and speak to you fairly soon. See ya.